please welcome the President and CEO of Jordan Advertising and Chair for the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber, Rhonda Hooper. Hello, hello, hello. You were smart and arrived early so you didn't have to park on the gravel. You're so brilliant. I know everybody wants to uh, have a little opportunity to get to talk, but I tell you what, we've got an action-packed program today, so uh, let's just get right along to it. But thank you for being here. This is the seventh annual State of the Economy that is produced by your Greater Oklahoma City Chamber. And, you know, it's, it's a, a really exciting thing to do. And Natalie, you're all by your little lonesome at Table 109, aren't you? By the way, the new executive director of the Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, Natalie Shirley. <laughs> but I'd, I'd like to thank and recognize our signature sponsor for today, and that's Arvest Bank. And Brad, Brad is not going to be with us quite early this morning, but he'll be here shortly. But Brad Krieger is executive vice president and regional manager of Arvest Bank. And so we appreciate what he does. Okay, for seven years, this event has been a key uh, event for our chamber members to access information and intelligence on what is going on with the economy. And we can all, we can all pretty much say that understanding economic trends has really become invaluable in the last few years. In our 2017 economic forecast, we anticipated that we would have challenges in the early part of the year, but by mid-year, we would see some, some improvement and we would finish strong at the end of the year. Guess what? Our economic forecast was on trend. We are seeing momentum in the latter part of the, of the year, and in fact, the Oklahoma City Metro has added 5,200 more jobs. We've seen the culmination of all of our efforts with some recent projects that have been announced, and that is MedXM. Sorry, I, people, when they wave at me, I'm going to wave back. Right, little Dickie T? Okay, including MedXM, McLaren Plastics, the Amazon Sorting Facility, LKQ Corporation, Niagara Bottling Company, SkyWest, and NTT Data. And through the end of October, the Chamber has worked to assist companies that have announced or have added an additional 2,581 jobs, representing $112 million in payroll and a capital investment of over $146 million. Now, these include uh, new-to-market companies as well as expansion of our existing businesses. There are a lot of companies that are interested in Oklahoma City right now. And in fact, the Chamber is currently working on 55 economic development projects, and, and we say they're in our pipeline, if you will. Those projects, if we remain hopeful that if our economy remains stable and the national economy remains stable, that we will see some of those make their final decisions and hopefully be expanding in Oklahoma City. Now, while the conversation over the last couple of years has centered around the softening of the oil and gas industry, our more diversified economy has made it a lot easier in weathering that storm. Other industry sectors have helped us ensure that our regional economy has remained stable during 2017. The industry sectors that have contributed most significantly to that percentage growth include finance and insurance, professional and technical services, and education services. In fact, the most recently released unemployment rate for Oklahoma City was 3.9%, and that is well below both the state and the national average. Now, as we look forward to 2018, we anticipate and continued strength in our job growth opportunities. And the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber will be releasing its 2018 economic forecast in early February, and they'll have more insights in that document. But I can tell you that no matter what the future brings, this chamber is going to actively work to ensure our future economic success. Now, one of the chamber's strongest tools is the Forward Oklahoma City program. 
and it's currently in its second year in a fifth cycle of programming. You know, the, the areas of focus in this program are all about realities today and what we are in, in facing as, as we will today. And one is the volatile pol political environment, an increasingly tight labor pool, and continued population growth. So those three factors. But in addition to focusing on economic diversity, Forward Oklahoma City also includes the focus on two important topics, and perhaps you've been at other events where we've talked about those, and those two are workforce development and innovation. You know, it's been two years since Oklahoma City was announced as one of two pilot projects for the Bass Initiative on Innovation and Placemaking, and that is a project between the Brookings Institution and, and Project for Public Spaces that examines what the economy of the future will look like. Their report and recommendations for Oklahoma City's Innovation District were released earlier this year, and we're already seeing synergy and collaboration among diverse industries that normally wouldn't be in the same room together. But there are some topics they're addressing in unified manner that's helping various industries work to better good. We're also in the process of rolling out our new talent strategy that will focus on keeping existing workers competitive and building a long-term pipeline for high demand and specialized jobs. You know, focusing on workforce will be definitely critical to ensuring Oklahoma City's future and our point of differentiation. And so to continue the conversation, on December 14th, John Ratzenberger, and you perhaps know his character. He was the postal uh, worker know-it-all on the TV hit series, Cheers. And John made know-it-all as a character, but he truly is behind workforce development. And he will address, in, in his, his keynote address on December 14th, opportunities for skilled workers, skilled, importance of skilled trades, and how we train the next generation of skilled workers. So we're looking forward to John Ratzenberger being at our event. You definitely don't want to miss out on this conversation, so if you haven't gotten a ticket, make sure you do, and if your company is sponsoring it, make sure you uh, nuzzle in and get one of those spots. But, okay, today. Today we have a panel of experts and a keynote speaker that are going to prepare you for the next year prepare you for the next year in terms of what's, where are we headed economically and where are our trends. And if that discussion proves like it has in the past, they'll definitely give you plenty to discuss in the few months. But our dynamic group of Oklahoma economists will join me in a conversation here, and then we will open it up to audience Q&A. And as I've said in the past, don't be intimidated. They won't bite your head off. Ask questions. All right, so our first dynamic panelist, that is, a, that is a task, you better be dynamic. Our first panelist is Dr. Robert Doffenbach. He's the Senior Associate Dean for Economic Development and Impact and Director for the Center of Economic and Management Research at the University of Oklahoma. Please help me welcome Dr. Doffenbach. Our next panelist is Dr. Mickey Hepner. He's the professor of economics at the University of Central Oklahoma's College of Business. Help me welcome Dr. Hepner. And our final panelist, and last but not least, is Dr. Dan Rickman, Regents, Regents Professor of Economics at Oklahoma State University Spears School of Business. Please help me welcome Dr. Rickman. Let me get a pen. How are you? Don't look at me that way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, we, we've done this for the last, what, five years? Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Feel like old home week. Yeah. Yeah, all right. You're a, a permanent appointment. Oh, am I a permanent yeah. appointment? Yeah. I don't think the audience would appreciate <laughs> that. but. All right, let's start the first question with an overarching uh, one on Oklahoma and the metro economy. And 
Dan, and I'm going to call you all by your first name, okay, if that's all right. Dan, I'd like you to take this first one, if you will. In looking at the state and Oklahoma City metro economies, what are the areas that concern you the most? And on the flip side, where are you most encouraged? Okay, well, I'm going to start with what I'm encouraged by most, because if I start with the concerns, I might never get to the other side. Uh, so, just kidding. Yeah, so, no, no, obviously, as uh, Rhonda had introduced, the economy is on the rebound. The, economy, uh, the energy sector's bottomed out, it's rebounded, it's growing once again. Uh, this shows up in all the economic statistics statewide in the metro. And the expectation is, you know, oil and gas are going to be used for at least a couple more decades very uh, intensively. So that's very positive for the state and local economy. Uh, for other factors, I think, you know, it's location. We're generally in the warmer part of the country, which you may not realize matters, but just talk to people in the northeast and upper midwest. Uh, in terms of their population statistics. You realize that that's a positive here, that we can get the migration from there. Uh, our proximity to Texas is a positive. Uh, Oklahoma City, having two major interstates going through it, uh, I see as a very positive for long-run growth. Uh, and I also, maybe not to be to understate, is I think the importance of the housing sector, you know, the available supply of land, and really the favorable housing regulations for development are real positive most, for most of Oklahoma, including Oklahoma City. Uh, there are a number of parts in the rest of the country where this is really a limitation on growth. And so this is something that I see as very positive here. So if I go to the concerns, I think the concern, uh, you know, we could talk about some long-term concerns, but I think the median one is the elephant in the room that everybody knows, is that we're not, we don't seem to be able to adequately fund basic government functions at, you know, at a level that we need to. And primarily, I'm thinking education. And I really base this on two, two um, things. One is anecdotal reports. I mean, I can talk, tell you the number of times that I've had fellow faculty who've had friends apply for a job at Oklahoma State. And they tell me that, but I always tell them, I said, well, we have some problems right now. And you, you have to consider whether this is where you want to bring your children. We're having troubles funding schools. That's anecdotal. So anecdotal sometimes doesn't always add up to reality but I, I've heard it quite a bit. Secondly, I've been doing some work with my um, co colleague, and we can pretty much trace to some underperformance of Oklahoma economy to its lack of education funding. Uh, really beginning in about 2008, really starting accelerating 2011, uh, the economy has really underperformed relative to what it should be, even accounting for what's going on in the energy sector. And just kind of examining the causes, when you look a little bit deeper, the th the item that's most correlated with is where we start coming back education funding. Thank you. Mickey? Uh, well, first, uh, thank you to the, the chamber for hosting this event. I was, I was all excited uh, to be here and wasn't nervous at all until you referred to us as a dynamic group of economists. <laughs> and, um, and so now I, I think we set our expectations a little too high. Um, for I you, think you can do it. So, um, uh, but again, thanks uh, for hosting this event. It's one of my favorites uh, each year to, to be a part of. Uh, when I look at the, the state economy, I, I noticed uh, earlier uh, this year a, a leveling off of economic activity and then a, a beginning of a, of a rebound and, and some steady growth across multiple sectors. And then in, in the last few months, I've, I've seen and noticed that that growth seems to be accelerating, which is a, which is a positive sign. It's still modest, but it, it, we seem to be improving. Uh, certainly, if you look at uh, that, that improvement, is starting to show up in some state tax collections. Uh, the last two months are our state sales tax collections, for example, which is the, the most reliable concurrent indicator in, in, the, in the tax collections. Uh, uh, that's had double-digit year-over-year growth, and so that's a, a tremendously good positive sign for us going forward. I think we're, you know, we have this, this leveling office improvement in the energy sector. I think we also have um, some, some looming national macroeconomic concerns. Uh, that, that uh, certainly some uncertainty as to how things are going to play out in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, that could certainly affect uh, the state of Oklahoma uh, as well. But when I think about the things that we can control, the things that we can have a, an impact on, the, the things that, that most alarm me seems to be this, this growing dysfunction we have um, within our, our state government, uh, certainly within the legislative branch, and an inability to come together and, and to find a, a, a way to, to compromise and, and find solutions to to improve the state of Oklahoma. And it's really hard for us to move forward as a state uh, unless we can get 
uh, you know, certainly leaders in, in both parties to, to agree that, that it's just not right that, that we have some schools in our state that can't afford to operate five days a week. Um, it's just not right that we have more than 15% or 14% of our state uh, still uninsured, that it's just not right that, that our correctional system continues to be habitually underfunded, that it's just not right um, that we're having to close down a third of our state's nursing homes and rural hospitals across the state. It's just not right that, that we're like this. And we have solutions on the table, and they're, they're pretty easy to, to, to come to, um, but, but the, the willingness to set aside some of the, the partisanship, the petty partisanship, and, and really focus on how do we make uh, agreements, how do we move together, how do we come together to move the state forward, to me that's an incredible challenge for us, and I think that's something that Dan touched on. Um, but to me, that's something we're going to have to overcome if this state's ever going to reach its potential and what we could be. Thank you, Mickey. Bob? Uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity to congratulate the community on its togetherness and approach to economic development. It's, it's really a model uh, for the, uh, the world as a whole. Uh, it stretches back, of course, to the original mass projects, but continues today. And uh, I just uh, celebrate the political economy of pulling together for economic development that this community has done and is certainly showing up in its uh, comparative growth. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, no, no, nothing on the flip side, huh? <laughs> and uh, just congratulations. There he's done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to do that. He likes to, you know, keep me on my toes. Well, then in that case, I'm going to direct this to you. Education and workforce. Some estimates indicate that at least half of the world's jobs are at risk of disappearing due to automation. How can we help our existing workforce prepare for these changes? And additionally, what are the education requirements for the jobs of the future? Uh, thank you very much for this question. I'm very, very pleased that you asked it because it's uh, what I prep for. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good oh. job. Over time, we've seen a lot of advances in productivity and output per worker. We've had a history of it in this country. Uh, we certainly recognize that productivity is a double-edged sword. It's how our incomes grow, how our real incomes advance because we produce more stuff, but it's also not evenly distributed about who it hits uh, in the economy. Henry Ford didn't, uh, didn't leave us where he found us and neither did Sam Walton. Uh, Walmart was the first retail operation to have its own communication satellite. And I was at a reception that Sam Walton uh, attended along with his wife in 1990. Uh, he, uh, I, I shook his hand, nothing wore off, and he asked, uh, uh, he asked what, what it was uh, I did. And I said, well, I was an economist, and that seemed to end the conversation. <laughs> And, and so he asked, he asked if he could get to use a phone. So I set him up to get to a phone. Uh, I walk over and join a conversation uh, with his wife and she's looking around. She says, where's, where's Sam? And I said, well, he went to use the phone. And I could see her kind of thinking about it. Why is he going to use the phone? And then she said, she said, oh, he's gone to check the Saturday morning sales. In 1990, I'm talking about. That's how much technology we've had and how it's advanced. Bob, you know Sam is from Oklahoma, right? He yes. Was born in, okay. Well, yes. Well, too bad he didn't. Why he was he was working 20. Too bad he didn't locate his business in Oklahoma. Okay. Right? <laughs> uh, so uh, we've seen a lot of disruption, and today we know that uh, Amazon seems to be scaring just about everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for, it, for them to attack higher education, too. We'll see if that happens. Uh, but the differentials of this kind of productivity advance are not going to be even. We've seen manufacturing get hit the hardest. Uh, in Detroit, for example, uh, we know that, that uh, employment is, is down in these areas. In fact, you've got some stats here, just, uh, just briefly there, 28,000 robots in Michigan. And that is one robot for every 20, uh, every 21.5 manufacturing workers. In Detroit, there are 15,000 robots, one for every 16.3 workers. In a recent study uh, that, that uh, was done at one of my uh, Center for Economic Research uh, assistant, uh, 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 sister institutions, uh, identified uh, differentials in productivity such that in 2010, we would have had eight million more manufacturing workers if we just had the same technology as we had in year 2000, in the year 2000. 
And uh, a, a recent study by the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, shows, and I, and I will quote in regard to this, one more robot per thousand workers reduces the employment to population ratio by 0.18 to 0.34 percentage points and wages by a quarter of a percentage point to half a percentage point. These are, these are huge phenomenal effects and they're going to be with us for some time and as robots uh, learn or are, ca or are capable of doing more and more what humans do, uh, that, then that increases the, the, the perfect substitutability between capital and labor. And the thing about, the thing about robots is you buy them once. Uh, you don't have to give them uh, paid leaves, uh, 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 vacation, uh, fringe benefits of various kinds, pay the employment taxes, health care insurance. And furthermore, uh, uh, when they break, uh, they don't sue you. So, <laughs> so you tell me which is going, which is going to win out uh, in that regard. So in terms of human capital requirements as we look to the future, uh, let this roll around on your tongue a little bit. Since 1992 to present day, there are fewer workers, fewer adult workers who have educational attainment levels of high school or less. Fewer. And this is despite a 33 million growth in employment since 1992, quarter of a century ago. 85% of that 33 million growth has been degreed, I'm talking a bachelor's degree or higher personnel. So it's clear that we are and have been for some time directed toward a knowledge-based economy. To what, but to what extent we really uh, recognize uh, that, that to be the case. So uh, we're looking at where do we go in the future? Well, a community, a community like Oklahoma City, like the state of Oklahoma, can't pull it together education-wise. I don't know what it says. I can't be very sanguine about uh, the outcomes if we don't get our act together. Now, there have been several efforts. I'm pleased to see and read about uh, the Oklahoma City Chamber effort, building top-tier talent for the greater Oklahoma City community. Uh, just in the editorial, The Oklahoman yesterday, several other programs are going on in the state to, to boost uh, workforce capability. And so we definitely hope that uh, we can gain increasing uh, traction. Uh, and it's gotta be across the full spectrum, not just K through 12, but K through college. Uh, and we need to be thinking along those lines. So if we don't get it together, I, I, I fear where it's going to lead us. Well, if we don't get it together, we'll all be robots and, and go from there. Dan, do you have any remarks on that? Uh, I would just add that that process is not going to be thwarted by um, ripping up our trade agreements. Uh, the, most of the jobs that have been lost or displaced over recent decades have not been because of uh, increased trade. It's been because of automation. And so what everything Bob says, there, there's no stopping this. It, it's coming. Uh, trade restrictions will not stop it, and we just need to prepare for it. There you go. Mickey? Well, I, I would just like to add that, that to me, this, this process, which has been going on for a long time and, and isn't going to be stopped, but it's something that, that uh, higher education in this state can and should play a critical role in, in helping us to adjust. Um, now, that doesn't mean everybody needs to get a, a college degree, but it also doesn't mean that any college degree will have the same payoff. The, the gains to, to, to this, this technological change, the, the benefits that will get dispersed across the population will not be dispersed to all college graduates equally. There will be winners and losers. There will be some that will have a higher payoff. And I think it's really important that within the higher education community that we accept and embrace this idea that if we're going to ask our students and our families um, to pay more to come to school, that we also need to be more mindful and responsible uh, with what the, um, the employment outcomes are going to be, that if we can't offer our, our students uh, an increasingly rigorous and relevant in, um, curriculum, um, then we really need to be asking ourselves what we're doing. And so that's a critical part of, of who we are. Uh, I think it's, it's important that we recognize that, that if we're going to help people be successful, and we're going to have to give them the skills, not just in the discipline knowledge, but the ability to, to think, to analyze, to solve problems, to help us um, do the things going forward that will be needed in the economy. It won't be much what we do with our hands, it's going to be what we do with our minds that shapes what's going forward, and higher education has to be a critical player in that. There you go. Well, let's change the topic to the federal economic policy. Dan, why don't you take the lead on this one? 
We experienced several exciting weeks leading up to the announcement of the new Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell. With the departure of Janet Yellen, what do you think will be the direction of the Fed in the short and long term, and how do you perfect this? Um, how do you predict that this will affect future interest rates? Well, the consensus seems to be, since I don't know the person as well, he's not a trained economist, so he doesn't really have an academic background where I could just read and say, I know this person's philosophy. But based on his votes as a current member of the FOMC and what others expect, they expect him to follow Yellen's low interest rate policy. Uh, he's a believer that there's the natural rate of interest worldwide is low, uh, that I don't believe that he thinks we need to go back up to the 4 to 5% which we used to think was our natural interest rate. Uh, right now, I think expectations are we might have more, one more rate hike at the end of this year, uh, maybe 2% Fed funds rate by the end of 2018, and about 2.5% end of 2019. Uh, more likely, this person may have their imprint on bank regulation. This is more uh, his background. He's from the investment banking background, uh, has spoken on this, has a, uh, extensive interest on this. So he might be a bit more active in that than maybe Janet Yellen, who is more just a trained economist. Uh, and so sometimes you just have a, a little different interest in, in backgrounds because of that. But I think in terms of interest rates, probably as we've been going. Okay. Nikki? We have, <clears throat> at the national level, we have 4.1% uh, unemployment. It's the lowest unemployment rate we've had in this country since 2000. Uh, and so it's, it's been an incredibly long time. Um, at the same time, we have this, this uh, you know, relatively historically low uh, unemployment rate. We have a proposal on the table for a, a massive tax cut, um, <clears throat> which, could, uh, which, which could help further add uh, f economic fuel to a, a, a labor market that's already getting pretty tight. Uh, I would argue that, that over the next 12 to 18 months, that if this tax reform, uh, this tax cut, uh, gets, uh, gets approved and gets passed, that the Federal Reserve is probably going to have to get even more aggressive with interest rates than it has been historically um, to, help, uh, to help, first of all, the, the, the increased deficit spending, but also to help kind of keep things cooler, to help keep things from overheating too much, to help um, keep inflation um, a little bit more in check. And so I'm a little bit more concerned, given the, the fiscal policy environment that we seem to be heading into at this current time, that the monetary policy might actually have to get a little bit more tighter than what we've seen in the last couple of years. Gotcha. Well, I couldn't uh, agree with you less. I mean, all of this. <laughs> <laughs> See why we have it's Bob on stage? <laughs> okay. All of, these, all of these huge deficits we've been running, what effect have they had? Who cares if they're going to, uh, to be uh, upwards of 18 to 20 uh, trillion dollars by the year 2026? Uh, uh, who cares if our unemployment rate? I mean, we haven't shown any infl inflation just because we had a bad report this morning and things went up. It doesn't mean inflation is going to get out of hand. So, so yeah, let's, 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 let's line our pockets a little bit more. One and a half trillion in additional deficits, you know, with the current tax bill. So let's, let's uh, wink, wink, do this tax reform and see where it heads this ultimately. Dan, you want to get in the middle of this? Well, the, lo the long run projection is for if we have a deficit, uh, add to the deficits, that in the long run this will reduce GDP growth. That you, if you could get the short run stimulus that, that Mickey's talking about, uh, whether the Federal Reserve responds or not may not matter, the markets will respond. They respond to what they think is happening on the fiscal side. And so maybe we get a little stimulus in the short run. Where they're giving the breaks don't seem to be where I would expect a lot of stimulus from. What I more would expect to see contraction in, uh, in the long run. And that's what the models actually predict at the moment. So the 3% the GDP growth coming out of the White House is unrealistic? Uh, fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> I believe them. <laughs> 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 You're getting really good. Okay. All right. Well, let's change our focus on energy. All right. Bob, I want to address this initially to you. It was announced that one of our local oil companies will export about a million barrels of light, sweet crude overseas this month. How do you think the export of U.S. oil to foreign markets will impact the industry? And how do you anticipate our state's oil economy will perform next year? Well, I'm very, very pleased to announce that we've had quite a, quite a positive trend, quite a tear in growth of uh, upward uh, of, of our uh, 
in exports of refined product, uh, crude petroleum refined products, some 175 million barrels per month we export. And that was, that's up from essentially around 35 uh, uh, million uh, per month when you're looking uh, back just uh, five, five, six years. Uh, with the relaxation of the ability to uh, export crude, uh, that stupid law was finally repealed. Uh, we've had uh, growth from essentially nothing to around 30 million barrels per month uh, exported. So we're looking at very positive trends. We can expect them to continue, and we certainly are looking for uh, underpinnings of support for the price of energy as a consequence of this. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic, and, and everybody knows what an optimistic person I am, so when, <laughs> but I am optimistic about the price of energy, and, it, and it's, it's not, uh, we'll see, we broke through that $55 barrier on, barrier on West Texas Intermediate Crude, and uh, maybe, and we've had a couple of bad days here, but maybe that'll be the new underlying support. Let's, uh, let's hope so. Uh, we certainly see a world economy where energy use is growing. We, add, uh, we have to add 1.5 to 2 million barrels per day in production. And let's not forget we've got decline rates going on at about 5% as well. We've seen Saudi Arabia with its uh, pressing prices down strategy that it had. I, I was never really convinced that they were out to kill fracking. I thought what they were out to kill was long-term, 20-year uh, deep water projects, and, and uh, I think they successfully did that. If uh, you look at the number of big projects that have been canceled as a consequence. So I think we've got at least uh, uh, one more surge. We've had 50 years of up and down in oil prices. We've seen just since this last summer a 35% uh, increase in price. And we'll continue on this roller coaster, but I think I just can't buy into the idea that we're looking at, uh, if you remember your economics, a perfectly elastic supply curve of, of energy. As this world demand grows, I think we'll, we'll continue uh, to see higher prices. Now, get out there to 2030 or so, and yeah, maybe we see more electric vehicles, maybe we see more re, uh, re, renewables uh, having an impact, but I still, uh, I still believe we've got one uh, I hope big positive cycle ahead of us, and, uh, and that that uh, that will occur in my lifetime, which means quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, I, I just I just hope that my uh, my prognostications about uh, energy prices are are better than my football predictions. Uh, my football predictions. My wife says, well, at least you're consistent. So we'll hope for the best, uh, but I think we're looking at a new uh, un undertone. But uh, there are a lot of people that disagree with me and think that we're, uh, we're going to be headed uh, uh, lower potentially. But uh, I'm particularly pleased to see that uh, the scoop and stack plays are talked about in the press as, as young plays. I mean, Oklahoma has a 150 year history uh, with energy production. And to, to think of uh, t uh, two regions being called young plays, I think is, oh, I like the sound of that. So I think uh, 2018 is going to be a good, good for us. I certainly hope you're right, Bob. Yep. Anybody else have any points? No? Nope. I'll just, oh, okay. um, just add uh, two, two uh, brief comments uh, to that. Uh, one, I would agree that the, the upside potential is, is certainly greater than the downside risk. Uh, to me, at, at this point, certainly over the next 12 to 18 months, I think that's even uh, more uh, heightened by the, the seemingly growing conflict that we're, we're seeing, uh, re-emerging of the conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which creates more geopolitical instability in the region, in the Middle East, and um, which, which will help buffer energy prices going forward. Uh, so I think there's a, a chance we could move up a little bit more. I wouldn't expect us to fall down too much farther uh, going forward. But I will say this, longer term, uh, this is something we still have to grapple with as a state, because there will be a last oil boom. I don't know when it is. Bob doesn't know when it is. Uh, maybe it's the next one. Maybe it's two away. Maybe it's the one we've already had. Uh, but there will be a last oil boom. Uh, the technological advances we're seeing in, in, in solar and, and, um, and wind power um, generation and distribution, those, those advances aren't going to stop. And, and so uh, demand is growing for energy, yes. Um, but that doesn't mean we're going to always 
um, be um, having a boom and bust cycle with, with oil prices going forward. There was a, a time when people foresaw that coal energy would last for, for you know, the 400 forever. years. Yeah. And, and we're seeing, you know, coal mining as an, as an industry is, is almost negligible in the United States now. So, so I just the cautionary point is there will be a last oil boom. We just don't know when it is. But some are saying it's already the one we just had. So. Okay. Well, I have one final question before we turn it over to the audience for any questions they may have. But this is our favorite topic, state fiscal policy. <laughs> The Oklahoma legislature put forward various fiscal packages to address the state's significant budget shortfall. We seem to face the same set of fiscal problems at the state and local level year after year. What are the causes of these reoccurring issues and what measures might be used to overcome these challenges? Mickey, would you take it? Well, I'll, yeah, I'll start and I'm sure everybody else wants to weigh in on, on this as well. I think it's important to keep in mind that Oklahoma is a low tax state. Our tax burden is one of the 10 lowest um, in the nation. Uh, and we're a low income tax state as well. Uh, and the property tax is, is you know, certainly all, uh, you know, among the, the lowest, if not the lowest in the, in the nation. Uh, so we're a low tax state. And, and if we look at what it is we're trying to do, we don't have enough revenue to keep our, all of our schools operating five days a week. We don't have enough revenue um, to, to adequately fund and staff our prisons. We don't have enough revenue to, to repair all the roads and bridges that we have uh, in the state. And we have a lot of needs that we're not able to fund because we just don't have enough revenue. And if you further look at the, the performance of the legislature, going back at least a decade, is this over-reliance year after year on one-time funds, on cash funds, to fund recurring expenses. And, and um, you know, so even starting next year, this last budget, depending on how the special session plays out, we could be looking at $450 million of one-time funds or even higher being used to fund the budget um, for this year. And that's something, we, that's a gap we have to close uh, going forward. So. Uh, so I, th I think really what we're faced with is a structural revenue problem, uh, insufficient revenue for the kind of services that, that frankly, a dynamic, modern, vibrant um, state should be able to provide its citizens. I've, I've said in a number of times uh, on this stage and, and in others that, uh, that a state that's um, populated with unhealthy, uneducated individuals who have to travel down dirt roads populated by criminals is not a state that's conducive to high rates of economic growth. It's not a state that's conducive to corporate relocations. It's not a state that's conducive to a place that's dynamic and vibrant, a place you want to raise your kids and family. But unfortunately, in the last few years, we've taken a step closer to that reality than the one we should be seeking going forward. And the only way we're going to start that, to solve that is we start to recognize that we have a revenue problem as a state, and it's time that we focus on that and how we can move that, state, the, that balance forward so we can move the state forward as well. I love how you talk faster and faster and faster and your hands get faster. <laughs> Revved up. I've seen the clock go down. I know. That's He's a... looking at the time and going, oh, I don't have much time. Okay. Uh, Dan or Bob, do you want to weigh in? Well, let's just see what the audience has to ask Okay. Us. All right. Well, before we do that, Dan, you have anything? Well, yeah, I, if you talk to people who study this from the public finance perspective and economics, I mean, we approach it from the perspective of saying you want to provide these services as efficiently as possible at the lowest cost. And that's really a, not always a statement or philosophy I hear that we start with. That recognizes that there's two sides to this. So you can't cut your way to prosperity because you need the services on the one hand. I don't see enough discussion about how we could be more efficient. I mean, when they say we're more efficient, sometimes they mean, oh, we've been cutting, cutting, cutting. That's not always more efficient. More efficient can be reorganization, uh, you know, other innovations. I don't hear much on that side. Then on the tax side, I always I hear the fantasy land that I like to call everything that people throw out there without thinking. You can't cut your way down and, and expect that's going to stimulate the growth and pay for itself. We, we have tried through experiments. We've analyzed this over and over. Every time somebody tries this, this ask Kansas, it fails. Ask Wisconsin, it fails. You cannot just cut and then do nothing on the expenditure side. So you really have to address both sides kind of with that overarching philosophy that, you know, the services that you need that are necessary for growing at the lowest possible cost. And I would sort of like to hear that statement more from the legislature. All right. Well, I think it's time that we turn over to our audience. Any respective questions you may have, please ra raise your hand and someone from the chamber staff will bring you a microphone. Don't all raise them up at the same time. <laughs> this is like my class. 
<laughs> We're going to call on people pretty soon. We're right here in the middle, uh, table 407. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm also an economist, John Wilner, OCU. I, you all talk about the education as a job. As near as I can tell, this society right now has a whole lot of social disagreement. I wonder if there's room in this education for social education, like social sciences, history, don't do the same stupid thing over and over again, that sort of thing, in all this education talk, which is mostly about technical skills and not human skills. That was a question. <laughs> I'll, I, I'll start it, and I'm, I'm sure Mickey wants to say something. Okay. I, I mean, I completely agree. If, if, you know, if you look at our lack of civic knowledge, that probably has something to do with our government dysfunction. And so historically, that's been an, an, an important part of our education, is that civic knowledge that we have in terms of what are our role as citizens and, and how can we participate and in, in create a better outcome for us, both societal-wide and economy-wide. So, I, I can't agree more. Uh, the role of our educational system is to produce not just better workers, but also better citizens uh, and people who are more engaged in their community. So it's got to be a critical part of who we are. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I would, I would just agree completely. Move on. I, I agree as well. I, I was a, a liberal arts uh, undergrad. Uh, we're not out uh, in, in colleges, universities, even in the business school, even in the engineering school to uh, produce just automatons. Uh, that go out there and work, but people who uh, understand civics, understand their role in society, understand, uh, understand and appreciate the arts. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you how important music is to me, and, and it was college that introduced music to me, classical music. And uh, that, that appreciation of life uh, uh, is, is very much a part of making a more complete uh, person. Do you play an instrument? No, but had I ever taken one up, I'm sure it would have been quite good. <laughs> <laughs> we, have a <laughs> we have a question right here. Would you mind standing so we can see your face? <laughs> Wonder if you. you could give us a prediction of you think the uh, yield curve will be inverted within the next two years, and if it does become inverted, will it lead to a recession? Well, I'll start that. I think, I think that we've got uh, a symbiotic relationship between the central banking system uh, and Wall Street going on right now. I think the only thing that's going to break that is if inflation starts taking a, a, an upward uh, a tick of, uh, of, say, considerable merit, like in the 3 to 4% range. Uh, then I think the game's off, and uh, the Fed will have no choice uh, but to attack the inflation. And when they do, who knows what that's going to do to stock prices. And the economy. And the economy. Well, yield curves, inverted yield curves, don't successfully predict recession all the time. So sometimes they coincide with recession, recession sometimes they do not. That, that's the only observation I have on that. Question right here. Is there a particular source of that our government should focus on for revenue to help solve our problem of having a income problem and not a spending problem. Well, you can't, you can't hate uh, uh, all taxes, and we hate the property tax in Oklahoma. And then we've, uh, we've gone and cut income taxes dramatically. I've studied this. Uh, we had, a, had a, a very close correlation between our fiscal problems arising and our reductions in the, in the state uh, income tax. And so I think that uh, you, can, you can hate uh, one tax, and we certainly hate the property tax, but you can't, uh, you can't hate two. And uh, uh, states spend money in very similar ways. They, they raise money in, in different ways. And I, I think that uh, we are hindering our communities by uh, not allowing broader use of the uh, property tax, but I have little, little uh, hope of uh, turning that around. Yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea of, of reducing or even eliminating the income tax. I just don't think you can do that if we're going to also have a really low property tax and a really narrow sales tax. As Bob said, you can't, you can't hate every tax. You have to rely upon something. Uh, and so as long as we're going to have uh, a really small uh, property tax uh, for state and local government, um, we're going to have to have an income tax, and it's going to have to be fairly sizable 
in order to collect the revenue that we need to have. And so that's why I've been an advocate for, for increasing the income tax um, in the state to roll back some of the tax, income tax cuts in recent years, uh, not because I, I love the income tax, but just because I, I see it as a more viable option than raising the property tax in Oklahoma, because that's the, you know, we tolerate the sales tax, um, we, we dislike the income tax, but we abhor the, the property tax. And so, um, so I, I think we'd have to rely upon raising the income tax. And it's, and it's not clear to me that a, high, a higher sales tax is any better than a high income tax. Right. Uh, we always sort of treat that, you know, it's okay to have a high sales tax, that will discourage people from moving there, that will discourage uh, spending. It, it, from what I've read in, in my experience, I, I don't know if the effects are that much difference in an income tax at the state and local level. Okay. Question right here. This table has good questions. Oh, there's... Who would like to address it? And if you would, please restate a little bit of the essence of what he asked. Right. The question is, if we if we go ahead and see a 20 percent uh, 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 corporate income tax dropping when, from the 35 percent, what uh, what are the implications of that? How much uh, how much would it help? Uh, I think it would help. I think uh, that uh, we could we could certainly uh, expect uh, some uh, some additional dollars flowing in brought from overseas. And, uh, back into the so I, I have no doubt that there's a positive side of it, but it also if you're raising the deficit, I don't know I don't I mean it's just uh, sometimes just things are getting too much. We spend 300 billion dollars just on, as the cost of refinancing the debt every year. 300 billion dollars we spend 500 billion on uh, defense, and and so you I mean you're looking at huge numbers here that are going to continue to grow with. Uh, with increased uh, deficit spending. Yeah, I, I guess I come back to the point that I would rather it be tax reform than tax cuts. So I would rather that when we do lower the corporate rate that we close the exemptions that allow some corporations to pay very little while others are stuck with a high rate. I think the more that we just really truly reform by getting rid of exemptions and lowering rates, the more positive effect this is going to have and then it won't have a negative effect on the deficit or crowding out investment in the future. That's primarily what economists, have, as long as I've been an economist, have been calling for. Uh, I'm not sure if we've gotten much closer to it over the years, but that, that I think is the more uh, reasonable, productive path to pursue. Question way over there. Didn't wear your tennis shoes, did today, did you? Hi, I was wondering if you could speak on the minimum wage issue, the communities that have implemented a minimum wage. Do we have evidence of success or failure or, or in how any of that might impact our budget situation? Well, most, uh, most studies, that, uh, and it's been a while since I've looked at the literature on this, but uh, most studies uh, uh, do not show much in the way of a negative impact, nor much in the way of a positive impact. Most economists feel that uh, let markets work. I mean, uh, what kind of society do you have if you can't exploit youth? <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so we, we somehow... You didn't say that, did you? You really didn't, okay. <laughs> we, we somehow, we somehow uh, uh, forget that labor markets are markets, and, and they work with supply and demand and price adjustments. And, uh, and, and I, I think if we raise the minimum wage too high, then people don't get jobs and learn job skills. And so my, my view is let the markets work. Generally, we see the, the cities where, that have, and the states that have raised minimum wage um, have been cities and states where the prevailing wage rates were already um, well above the federal uh, minimum wage anyway. So it wasn't, uh, the federal wage wasn't binding on, on economic behavior, and, and so there's less resistance to raising the minimum wage in those states. I think it's a little bit more problematic in a, in a relatively low wage, low income state. 
Apparently I was wrong. They didn't like your answer. We will find out if this is real or not. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Our program is about to begin. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. Wow. It's not in this building. We're good. Oh. <laughs> it must have been what Mickey had to say that set up the alarm. <laughs> and you were saying, <laughs> no, any, any other remarks? And sorry for I the loud noise. Following oh. on Mickey, I, I think allowing states and localities to decide more for themselves what rates they want makes more sense because prevailing wages and market conditions vary so much. So I, I'm not as in favor of the federal government trying to move it up so high, but I'm also really not in favor of states telling localities they can't. And so I've seen it from two sides, both sides that are sort of bothersome to me, that if communities know more for themselves and what would make them more prosperous and make them have a, a better economy, we should leave it to them. Okay. Question here, Javier? Thank you, Rhonda. Um, we were downgraded as our credit rating was downgraded last uh, May because of our recurring revenue issue. I imagine there's going to be another hit with this issue, the special session. When do we get to the rock bottom and the other two agencies give us a lower credit rating? And what's that impact look like? When are, when are we going to get a better rating? When are we going to hit rock bottom and the other two agencies? rate us in, in low levels. Oh. I'll, I'll interpret for Javier. <laughs> no, I would just say, I would just say that this is, this is always something that we have to be concerned about. Uh, that, that, that when you don't raise sufficient revenue, then your credit rating goes down and you end up having to pay more for credit and that ends up costing money. So it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's something we have to pay attention to. And, and the revenue growth that we're projecting, this is something I am involved in, is not sufficient to make up what our structural deficit is. So this is not going to solve itself until we politically address it. It's not something we're going to suddenly one or two years of some growth say, okay, we're, we're out of this. Uh, we're, we're still in the middle of it. We had a downgrade um, uh, several months ago. We had a, a warning last week, um, uh, again, about the same issue. Um, but let's look at you know, what happened in the legislature to this year. We had a massive um, 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 difficulty meeting the budget, funding the budget this year, but it wasn't really until we got a crisis that we actually got close to having um, any new revenue being uh, to be generated. I fear, um, because of the level of dysfunction that we're seeing, that, that this will only be driven by a crisis. Um, and, and so um, you know, the concern would be that unless we're forward-looking, unless we're prescient enough, unless we look ahead at, at the train wreck that's unfolding before us, um, that, that we'll have to go through the wreck before we, we start to getting on the right track. Question at the back of the room. Oh, thank you. Can you explain, or how would you explain the disconnect between political instability and the continued rise in the stock market? Loaded question, huh? Mickey? <laughs> People are crazy. Uh, that's it? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's I guess 
<laughs> They're counting on the tax reform. All right, now you got to say something. You're not going to say anything, are you? Well, I just, I, I, I think that we have a lot of political discord in, this, uh, in, in our society. I don't think it's going to lessen. I think a lot of it has to do uh, with the death of the middle class blue collar lifestyle. And I, I don't see that coming back. I don't, I see our social tensions uh, continuing to rise. I don't really know what reverses it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just, it's just uh, uh, the nature of things today. And we're, we're as communities, we're going to have to take care of our own. We're going to have to make sure our, our, our children, not only are in their education, they know how to do some math and science and things of that nature, but, but they have good personal qualities. They stay away from drugs. They learn about jobs. They learn about careers. Uh, we're going to be more and more on our own, I think. And, and like I said uh, initially, I, I celebrate this communities, and this, this metropolitan area communities, uh, uh, drive to, to have a coordinated economic development. And, and I just uh, uh, propose that we continue down these paths and, and, uh, and look to a, a good future for this region and the state. Excellent. I tell you, we are out of time, but you know, I asked y'all to be dynamic. I think you totally blew it out of the park, including making the alarm go off. <laughs> what, let's say thank you to these wonderful economists. Well, please enjoy your lunch, and we will be back to resume uh, the program shortly. And w please look at the screens for our sponsors today. Thank you so, so much. <laughs>